Well, glad that you're here in the house. Uh, we are in week two of a series that we're calling, you saw us on the video, You Asked For It. And for all of our guests today, just to catch you up, uh, way back at Easter, uh, we took a spiritual survey of our church family, and we asked lots of different questions, and that just helps us better minister to the congregation here. And one of the questions we asked on that survey is, what's one topic from God's Word that you would like addressed? And hundreds of our people, uh, many of you in this service, you, you, you wrote in on that, some anonymous, some not. We compiled all of that together, and really that's what this series is all about. And so each and every single week, this is just week two, uh, I'm going to address one of the most requested topics uh, from God's word, of course. Uh, why? Because you asked for it. So we're having a lot of fun, and we're going to have a lot more fun again today. And so today's subject, it got so many votes, and honestly, it, it makes sense, because this, this issue touches every single one of us. Whether you're brand new to church, or you're just a veteran, you've been, you've been saved for decades, it touches every single one of us. And here's what you want to know about. You want to know how to handle family issues. Family issues. Every single one of us has a family, and how many all know we have family issues. In fact, I, I need to know who I'm preaching to uh, this morning. Who, who would raise a hand, and I'll go first, and my hand's going to be up, uh, but who would raise a hand and say, at one point in your life, you've had an issue in your family? Come on, raise a hand, raise a hand, okay. Awesome, awesome, put your hand down. If your hand was not up, I just want you to know, you're probably the issue, okay? Uh, just, it is what it is, it is what it is. Every family include, I went first, every family has, has issues. Uh, I say this a lot, but, but so many of us um, are, we have so many issues that, that we need tissues, you know, like it's just, it's just, it's a problem, it's a problem. And so we're going to talk about that today, and then also a little promo for next Sunday. Somebody say next Sunday. Uh, week three, uh, really excited about the potential of next Sunday's message. I'm going to let you know where we're going next Sunday. Uh, we're going to talk about mental health. And I think, and I think you would agree with me, that that is a very necessary topic in our culture, and it needs to be talked about in God's house. And so that's next Sunday. Bring somebody with you. Uh, really going to minister uh, to your heart. And so excited about that. But today, God's got something special for you and me, because we all got family issues. So grab a copy of the scriptures and turn with me to Mark chapter 3. Mark chapter 3. I don't think I've ever, and I've been a pastor for way over a decade, I don't think I've ever preached on this passage before, and I'm really, really excited about what God's going to do through this message. But Mark chapter 3, that's the second gospel, it's in the New Testament. Words will be on the screen in the room and online if you don't have a Bible or Bible app. But I'm going to pick up in verse 20, we're going to read a lot of verses, uh, and I'm going to read out the New Living Translation. So Mark chapter 3, starting in verse 20. One time... Jesus entered a house. We don't know which house. It could have been Peter's house, one of the disciples. But Jesus entered a house, and the crowds began to gather again. Soon he and his disciples couldn't even find time to eat. When his family heard what was happening, would you hit pause for a second, okay? Time out. This is so, so important. I just want to remind every single person in the room and also those online, I want to remind you that Jesus had a family. And we forget that. Like Jesus had an earthly family. It goes way beyond that. Here's the makeup of his family, which again, I think it's very, very helpful to understand. Jesus had half brothers. Same mama, different dad. Not only that, uh, he had a stepdad, of course. And, and we don't know this for sure, but context clues in the scripture, specifically the New Testament, um, you can, it's not a big leap to say that Joseph, uh, his stepdad, that, that he died young. Like there's a lot, we don't know for sure, but there's a lot of context clues. So if that's the case, that also means that Jesus had a single mom for a while, okay? So I just want you to know, his life is very relatable to all of ours, all right? And you know her, of course, as, as Mary. So when his family heard what was happening, they tried to take him away. He's out of his mind. It's his family saying this, verse 22. But the teachers of religious law who had arrived from Jerusalem, that's the pastor's, they said, he's possessed by Satan, the prince of demons. That's where he gets the power to cast out demons. So just make sure we're all on the same page. Back to back, Jesus, God in flesh, he is called by his family crazy, insane, and then also in the same breath, the pastors of the day call him demon-possessed. Make sure that you're understanding what's going on here, okay? Like, this is serious, very, very serious. The Bible is wild, okay? It's wild. Verse 23, Jesus called them over and responded with the illustration. How can Satan cast out Satan, he asked. A kingdom divided by civil war will collapse. 
Verse 25, similarly, a family splintered by feuding will fall apart. Wow. Let that sink in for a moment. Now, same chapter, move down a little bit to verse 31. Then Jesus' mother and brothers came to see him. They stood outside, make note of that, we'll get back to that later, and sent word for him to come out and talk with them. So they would not go inside the house, they stayed on the outside. There was a crowd sitting around Jesus, and someone said, your mother and your brothers are outside asking for you. Jesus replied, and I almost picture this with some serious side eye, okay? Jesus replied, who's my mom? Who's my mother? Who are my brothers? The, the Bible is juicy, okay? Like, there's some stuff going on here. This is awesome. Verse 34, then he looked at those around him and said, this is his church family, look, these are my mother and brothers. Anyone who does God's will is my brother and sister and mother. Keep the Bible open, but let's pray quickly together. Lord, we love you so much. We thank you for your word. May your word take root in our hearts. May we apply it to our everyday lives. We love you, and we ask all this in Jesus' name. And the church said, amen, amen. amen. Uh, for those taking notes, I'm calling this message today, Family Feud. I almost played the music for you, but I didn't have time to get into all that today. Um, I, uh, I DM'd Steve, Steve Harvey, but he didn't write me back. You know, I tried to get him here. I'm just kidding. Um, but uh, picture Steve Harvey, three-piece suit. Survey says, uh, what I love about that show is no matter what answer the family gives, even when it's awful, horrible, makes no sense, what do they say? Good answer, good answer. Like they are trained very well, right? But they look ridiculous. Um, you've probably seen some of the failed videos like I have online and they are amazing. They are a blessing from God. Um, but here's the deal with that show. That show is typically two families feuding it out. But how many y'all know that's not real life all the time? Here's real life. There's usually a feud within the same family. There, there, there's, there's a battle, there's, there's dysfunction, you could say. And honestly, that's what's happening with Jesus' earthly family. Like that passage I just read, I, I, I wish I would have preached it many times before because it's so rich with so much. And honestly, it encourages me. And here's why. If Jesus' earthly family was jacked up, that makes me feel a lot better about my family. Come on, can I get a better amen in God's house? If his family, the Son of God, if they had issues, then it's maybe just maybe okay for us to have some issues different times that we can work through together. And so today, all I want to simply do with our time together is I want to study Jesus' earthly family. And as we do, I want to point out the three dysfunctions of a family. And then, of course, we're going to bring you hope and practicality to that of how you push back against that and have a healthy family. So if you're taking notes, the three dysfunctions of a family. And again, the goal is to identify it and see God bring healing and restoration. So here's the first one. If you're taking notes, write this down as well. The first dysfunction of a family, number one, is disbelief. Disbelief. Looking back at the text that we just read together, you have Jesus and he is doing amazing things. Well, what, what do you mean, pastor? Here's what I mean. He is healing the sick. Can we agree that that's amazing? Even if you don't believe in Jesus, can you agree that's a good thing, right? Someone who's sick and now they're better, that's a good thing, right? Can I get an amen? Come on, help me out, all right? Uh, he is, he's casting out demons. That's a good thing. People that were in bondage. That, and by the way, that is a real thing still today. Well, I've never seen that. Well, I have in person. Like, like, like it is real. It has happened in our church before. Like it is a real thing where people are possessed, taken over by the devil. It is a real thing, but how many all know, even though that's real, God is real and he has way more power and he can deliver us. That's good news. And so, 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 so what I'm trying to get across is Jesus is doing good things that people should be cheering like should be excited about. And there is a crowd that is following him. The house is packed, right? Uh, they're, they're believing in him. But I want you to notice the compare and contrast here. The crowd is following. The crowd is believing. But Jesus' family is not. Like they're not. They are not in that kind of mindset. So they're not following him. His family wasn't celebrating him. Do you ever feel that way? They're not, I'm doing good things, but they're not celebrating me. Uh, Jesus' family, they weren't showing up to the revival services. Uh, his family, we read this, actually wanted him quiet. They wanted him quiet. I'll, I'll say it to you this way. Jesus' family knew Jesus, obviously, but they weren't truly following Jesus. They were kind of just a fan, a fan. 
And really, as I see it, there's three different levels of relationship with Jesus and his family definitely fell into this category. And honestly, a lot of people in America and a lot of people, especially in Texas and Houston, fall into this category. You'll see it on the screen. But the first level of relationship with Jesus is a fan, which means to admire God from a distance. And this is where his family was. Like, like, like they knew Jesus, obviously, in the house, right? Like, like they were around Jesus sometimes. They went to church sometimes. In fact, people just in general in this category, the fan category, they call themselves Christians, but they are not. They are not. You're only a Christian if you follow Jesus. You're only a Christian if you have given your life to him, if he has impacted your life. Are you perfect? No, absolutely not. He is perfect. But it's not just, oh, I go to church every once in a while. It's not what makes you Christian, all right? So we have it twisted. And so, so his family was definitely in this category at this point. They're a fan. They admired God from a distance. But anytime God, son of God, Jesus, anytime he wanted to get involved to change some things, they're like, no, I'm, I'm gonna stay on the outside. And maybe that's you. Here's a second level of relationship, and this is where I want you to get to today. It's a follower of Jesus, and this means to walk in obedience, okay? And these, these are Christians. These are people that have given their life to Jesus, are going to heaven one day, not by your works. The work on the cross was once and for all, and it was everything needed for salvation. Can I get a better amen, okay? And so you are walking in obedience. You're following him. You have surrendered your life to Christ. And again, if you're a fan, I'm believing you're going to take a step at the end of the service to become a follower. His family was not there yet. And then here's the last category. And if you're a follower, I want you to take a step today. This is a friend of God. So you have fan, follower, friend. And a friend pursues personal depth and trust with God. It is not a surface level uh, relationship. It's not a get out of hell free card. They want, they want to know God and be known by God. They, they want to walk with God intimately every single day day. It's like breathing, that they want to be close to him. And if you're a follower, I um, believe in God that you're going to take a step into that friendship category. It's so, so important. So fan, um, follower, and friend. And so here's the personal um, application with this point. Where, and don't answer out loud, just in your heart, where are you? Where are you? And wherever you are, uh, prayerfully consider taking a step. In fact, I challenge you to take a step today, because here's the reality. Before I get to point number two and three, before I get to some more practical application, if you don't get this one right, you will always have dysfunction in your family. Like this is the most important one, to believe, to follow. Well, well, pastor, my husband doesn't believe, or my kids don't believe. You are not held responsible for them. You are held responsible for you. Can I get an amen? In God's house. And as you live authentically, uh, authentically for Christ, you will be a great example to them. And I'm telling you, they will eventually jump into the pool. They will. They'll eventually jump in. They'll eventually go all in as they see your good works, as they see you imperfectly follow a perfect God, as they see the change on the inside of you, it will make a difference. But it starts with believing. It starts with following. Where are you in your personal relationship with the Lord? All right, here's the second dysfunction uh, of a family. Definitely something that Jesus had to deal with with his earthly family, and we all have to deal with it. Number two is division. Division. A lot of division in our country, and that really, really started in our families. Uh, remember Jesus' powerful statement about families and what we read in Mark 3. He said this, a family splintered by feuding will fall apart. Like, I want that just to sit heavy on you for a second because it should. It should. A family splintered by feuding will fall apart. And so hear me loud and clear, church. Like, this is so, so important for you to remember that in your family, you are called to be united. Like you must have, we will never have unity again in our nation unless we first have unity in our families and in our churches. Come on, can I get a better amen today? Do you believe that? You should. It starts with us. Doesn't start with the government. Doesn't start with policy. It starts with God's people and God's house. It starts with us. Jesus spent so much time talking about unity. And you will always find dysfunction where there is division. Now, what I want to do, because I'm not just here to encourage you or hopefully inspire you, like I want to give you practical application. And so I want to show you just two quick things that you can do in your family today to get unity again. Because you need unity, not to be divisive, but to be in unity. So two things, and I'll give you lots of examples that we use in our family. Are we perfect? No, but we're very, very uh, purposeful in this. Uh, here's the first thing. Write this down. If you want unity in your family, number one, you need intentional schedules. Intentional schedules. So here's how we do this. We don't overfill our schedules. Some of you are like way, way, in fact, I'll probably say most of you are way too busy, way too busy. And you're way too busy on the things that are not most important. Are they important? Yes, but they are not most important. 
And so you got to be a lot more intentional with your family schedule. Give you some practicality to this in our, in our family. Uh, we don't overfill, and here's what that means. Um, our kids, and we have three of them, okay? A lot of you are crazy like us. Uh, some of you are crazier, and you got more than three kids. God bless your soul. Bless you, okay? Um, we love our three kids, but three feels great for us, all right? And so um, here's how we have to do it, because we got, we got a lot of kids, is, is, is our children, and you can disagree, and, and that's fine because you can be wrong. That's cool. That's cool. Um, but... Um, but our kids do one sport or one music thing at a time because it's times three, okay? Like, like they don't run our lives. We run our lives. Y'all getting real quiet on me. That's okay. That's okay. Uh, you can disagree, but, but, but that's just, that's, that's one of the key things. Like your kids do not need to do 14 sports and 14 music classes, you know, plus karate on the side. It's like, no, like, no, you know, For, first of all, like, are you trying to get bankrupt? Like what's going on, you know? Uh, but that's just, pra- I'm just trying to help you today. Like this, this is very, very helpful, I hope. Um, here's another big thing. And if you have teenagers, especially, you need to do this. But we do this with our kids. And we got one that's about to be a teenager. But, but especially teenagers, because I know they get busy. And if they're driving, it's, it's so hard to get things connected. But you got to be intentional. Uh, we have a goal in our house that at least three nights a week, we have dinner together as a family. And this is big. It is big. And, and let me say it this way. With, with the TV off and devices out of the way. Okay. Uh, buy one of those little boxes on Amazon that you can put the phone, you know, phones in, and then an hour they unlock. If you really need some help with that, you can find it on Amazon. But like, like that's a big deal. Like we're connected. Well, Pastor, it's going to be awkward. It's going to be awkward when you start. By the way, when, whenever you make a change, it's always awkward. There's always pushback from the family. What are we going to talk about? I don't know. We may sit in silence for the first couple ones, but eventually somebody is going to say something, do something, you know, make a noise. I don't know. Like something's going to happen. All right? But, but it is worth it. It is worth it to have, and you can look at the stats on your own, but it's a game changer for families. You want to be united, you need to be intentional with your schedule. One, one other thing, and I kind of uh, alluded to it earlier, um, so, so important. Remember, I, I said, hey, remember this for later. Um, in the story we read, true story, Jesus is doing all these incredible things inside the house. Remember I said, we'll come back to that later. He's doing so many incredible things inside the house, but where's the family? They're outside the house. Okay? So incredible things, ooh, don't miss this. Incredible things inside the house, but the family is on the outside of the house. Let's make it practical. You need Jesus in your house. You need Jesus in your house. I'll I'll twist it even a little bit more. You need to be in the house where God dwells. You need to be in the church. You, You need to be around Jesus. Don't stay on the outside when Jesus is doing great things on the inside. So don't keep God at a distance. You come in close. You make sure church is a priority. It's a non-negotiable. You, you, need, you need to hear this. Hook, line, and sinker. Like, you need to believe this, hear this, take this to heart. But what you consider optional, I'm talking about church attendance, what you consider optional, the next generational, or ne- the next generation will find unnecessary. So what you consider optional, the next generation will find unnecessary. So intentional schedule number two, uh, purposeful connection. Purposeful connection. You got to have fun together. In fact, the first uh, session I have counseling people, and I am not a counselor, so I don't do it very often. There's a lot of cases that I'll refer out. We had incredible counselor connections in this church uh, around um, our city here, uh, Christian counselors. But anytime I'm doing it, that's typically the first question, whether it's a family counseling, uh, wh- wh- whether it's marriage counseling, whatever. I say, hey, when's the last time you had fun? And can you imagine the answers that I get? I can't remember. It's been a long time. Like, it's critical. Like, have fun together. It's a big deal for our family. I talk about it all the time um, that, that we do once a week. We call it family movie night, and, and we shout, and, and we scream, and we laugh, and, and, and we eat pizza and junk food and soda, and we don't count calories, y'all. I mean, it's amazing. It's amazing. It's amazing. I, I eat enough calories for the whole week. I mean, it's just awesome. This is awesome. Like, we have an incredible time together, but maybe that's not how it would work for your family. Maybe it needs to be Taco Tuesday, you know. I don't know. Uh, maybe it needs to be... Um, you try a new restaurant because your, your kids are older. Uh, maybe it, it is going out to a movie, you know. May, 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 maybe it's, hey, we like to go on walks. Or, 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 or hey, we like to go uh, to, to, to Galveston, which I know nobody wants to go there, but my family and I. But, but like, maybe it's that, you know. And, 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 and so I'm just, you got to find something. Something that you all enjoy together. you got to be purposeful with it. Connection moments, making memories together. Here's another big one quickly, is serving together. 
It's why I love serve day so much that we do in the summer. Like I love it so much because it's babies all the way up to the grandparents, all in between that are serving side by side and something happens when you're in the trenches of ministry together. There is a brotherhood, there's a sisterhood that you would not experience outside of that. Look at our family. We serve. My wife serves. Our son serves. Our girls, where they can fit in because they're younger, they are serving. Like this is my mom and dad serve. This is a big deal. It's a way you connect together. If you're with me, say amen. Purposeful connection. All right, here's the last dysfunction of the family. Number three is this. Write this down if you're taking notes. Dishonor. 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 And honestly, this, this may be the one that we're all most egregious. That would just really, really, a lot of dishonor in the house. Dishonor, dishonor. I want you to picture the scene in Mark 3. Again, the only text we've read so far. And I want you to try to visualize this as best you can, kind of what's going on there. Remember, in the house, Jesus is preaching and teaching. He's ministering. Uh, families on the outside. The house is packed. Jesus is healing. It, it's awesome inside, but we get the family at a distance. Family on the outside. And at the very end of what we read together, it says this. It says, it says um, his family wanted him to stop and come out to them. Do you remember that? Wanted him to stop. Like, they, they didn't go into him, right? They didn't go into the house. They wanted him to stop. So, so here's how this would look in our context. I guess I'm preaching, I'm teaching, I'm getting them all. This would be our context. If my mom, like right now, and she, she ain't gonna do it, but right now, if my mom mid-sermon came up in front of all of you and said, excuse me, Ryan, can you stop? Like, 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 like I, I need you for, like, can, can, can you stop? Like, that, that's the context. Somebody say awkward. Is that not dishonor right there? That is dishonor. I am fulfilling the calling of God on my life. I, I am doing what I am supposed to do. And you won't even come in? You send a proxy? You send some random person or family friend, whatever it was? to come get me in the middle of my, in the middle of me praying for people to be healed. You want me to stop. You want me to stop. This is dishonor at the highest. And I want you to feel that. I want you to see that in your mind's eye as you picture the scene. Like, this is a big deal. It's a big deal. And this would continue on. I don't have time to get into all of it. But a few chapters later in Mark chapter six, you can turn there if you want, but I'm just gonna sum it up quickly. And I've preached on this part before. But in Mark chapter 6, Jesus, he goes back to his hometown of Nazareth. And there the Bible says that he could not do many miracles. And the Bible gives us the reason why. It's because he was dishonored in his own hometown. So dishonored with his family and dishonored in his hometown. Like I want you to think about even, like even just for a moment, wrestle with the theological um, ramifications of that that because there was a lack of honor, there were no miracles. Like th that put a limit on God. Like, isn't that crazy? Like, I don't even know how to like explain that all the way. Like, like, like that's crazy. A lack of honor, dishonor. So there was not many miracles that Jesus could do. Did he want to do them? Yes. Did he have the power to do them? Yes, he's already proven that. But there was a lid on the miracles. There was a lid on the intervention. In fact, I preached this before you can see on the screen. Dishonor disrupts the divine. And this is true for your family. If there is a lack, come on, I'm preaching to somebody today, you need this desperately. If there is a lack of honor in your home, what do you mean, pastor? If you're always cutting each other down with your words, in front of them, behind them, doesn't matter. If you are constantly belittling them, if you are constantly looking for the dead and the ugly and the dried up instead of trying to be like a hummingbird, baby, and looking for the good. If, if you are constantly doing things that, that are dishonor and passive aggression, I'm telling you, it will destroy the potential of what God wants to do in your family. Well, pastor, they don't deserve my honor. You're wrong. You're wrong. You're wrong. You honoring them has nothing to do with them nothing to do with them. It has everything to do with you. What do you mean? We are called to honor no matter what. We're called to honor. Honor. To be honorable. To treat them honorably. Well, well they don't honor me. You're not responsible for them. Well, if you only heard on my spouse talk to me, I'm sure it's awful and it does need to change. But you're not responsible for them. You're responsible for you. 
And as you honor them, I'm telling you, it will unleash and open up the heavens for God to do miracles in your marriage and in your family. That you would honor them. That even if they're cussing you out, that you would hold your tongue. That you would say, you know what, I know you're angry, but I love you. I care about you. I'm telling you, it would make a difference. Having honor in your home is the difference maker between your home feeling like a haven, a safe place, or your home feeling like hell on earth, a place you do not want to go to. It is the difference maker. And it literally puts a lid on the God-given potential of what he wants to do. Do you honor Jesus in your home? Do you honor each other in your home? Now, I want to end today with some hope. Because odds are there's a lot of us that we have at least one of these three dysfunctions in our family right now. You're looking at Jesus' and family, you're like, well, that's, that's, that's pretty bad, but it looks pretty close to kind of what we're struggling with. And if that's you, I want to end with hope today. Because even though Jesus' family, his earthly family, was dysfunctional, they did not stay dysfunctional. Jesus did a work in his family over time. And I was praying for you today, and I feel like that was a word for somebody. Over time. Why well, I didn't see any results in the last couple of years. And I keep coming to church, and I keep inviting them, but they're not coming with me. There's this empty seat beside me because they should be there, pal. I get all of that. But you don't give up. Jesus didn't give up. Even though, even though his own flesh, or not his own flesh and blood, but his own earthly family, even though they did not believe in him, even though there was division in the house, great, great, great dysfunction, and even though there was dishonor, over time, Jesus did a work. And I'm going to prove it to you. Turn to Acts chapter 1. This is how we're ending. I'm about to pray. Acts chapter 1, verse 14. Here's what it says. They all, somebody say all, met together and were constantly united. So there's unity. In prayer. So there's faith, unity, faith, belief. They all met together and were constantly united in prayer along with Mary, the mother of Jesus. So mama is there. Okay, mama is there. Several other women. I love that, that God's word does not push away women. That God's word is all about women. Like, come on, somebody. I love that about God's word. Like, no, no, no. Like, they're, they're at the forefront. Several other women. And who else is there? The brothers of Jesus. Come on, somebody. Jesus can work in your family over time. I'm telling you, that family was jacked up. It was. We read it. It was messed up. But over time, Jesus did a work. And so I've got good news for you, Christ Covenant. Even if your family is dysfunctional right now, there is hope for you. Jesus is still in the miracle working business. He is still all about reconciliation. He's still all about forgiveness. He's still all about healing. There is nothing too hard for God. Well, pastor, it's impossible. Did you know our God is the God of the impossible? He can heal. He can restore. He can do it. He can do it. Bow your heads, close your eyes. Jesus, we thank you that you are the healer. That even though some of our families are dysfunctional right now. There is hope. There's hope, there's hope, there's hope, there's hope. So I pray, God, that we'd apply this message to our lives, the different practical things, whatever we can do. Maybe it's something I didn't even say, but Holy Spirit, you gave us the idea that that's, that's how cool you are. You can, you can custom fit a message to hundreds of people at the same time. I just love that. And I pray lastly, every head bowed, every eye closed, for anybody who's far from you, I pray today would be their day of salvation. Friend, Jesus loves you so much. Don't stay on the outside. Invite Jesus into your heart. Invite Jesus on the inside. Don't keep him at a distance. I don't want to just be a fan. I want to be a follower. So that's you today. I want to lead you in a prayer right now in the room and online. Just whisper this after me. Jesus, today, I become a follower. Come on, whisper this to him. Jesus, today, I become a follower. I believe you are God. I don't keep you at a distance. I come close. Jesus, I believe. You got to talk to him right now. Jesus, I believe you died on the cross, and I believe you rose from the dead. And so right now, you've got to ask him this all across this place. Right now, I ask you, Jesus, to forgive me of my sin, to clean me up, to make me new. I'm no longer a fan. I am now a follower. God, I thank you for those that are putting their faith and trust in you that are, that are going to allow you to impact their life. God, we thank you for that, Lord. 
thankful for what you've done all day long. We give you glory and we give you honor. In Jesus' name, and the church said, come on, encourage those that just gave their life to Jesus. Thank you so much for joining us today. We hope you sensed God's presence. If you made a decision for Jesus Christ, or if your life has been impacted in any way, please send us an email at info at ChristCove.net. We would love to hear your story. And for those that committed your life to Christ, we want to help you on your new journey by sending our free Start Bible Kit in the mail. If you'd like to partner with us financially, simply click on the Give tab at ChristCove.net. There it will take you to a safe and secure page where you can set up a one-time or recurring gift to help us accomplish our vision, heaven full and hell empty. And as always, you can find out more about Christ Covenant on our website or on Facebook or Instagram at Christ Cove Houston.